while we have been building public housing and moderate income housing, we have been providing funds in the way of low interest mortgage loans for middle income residents, upper middle income residents, uh, to allow them to purchase single family housing. Uh, that program, coupled with our highway network, built uh, much as uh, a military expense necessary to uh, provide easy access from one end of the country to another for military vehicles, has resulted in the large-scale movement of middle-income population out of central city and into the suburbs. And now we find that we have a polarity. The low-income residents have moved into central city, many of them occupying the low-income housing provided and others occupying the housing that was left behind, uh, the housing that was left behind by the middle-income residents that have fled. This term has been called white flight or middle-income uh, flight from Central City. And we have this polarity. The low-income housing that we built in the Central City did not, in fact, provide the opportunities that we all hoped it would. In fact, people live, there is more than just housing that is uh, desired by people who move to cities. They desire the opportunities, the opportunities of access to jobs, to schools, uh, to contact, social contact with others. And this they have not been able to find in cities which are now predominantly uh, cities of the poor and occupied by the poor. We find when we look at the statistics that a high percentage of people with high income groups live outside Central City and a high percentage of people with low income groups live within Central City. And we find that our suburbs are growing at a rate of five and six times that of the population growth of our cities. And our central cities are, in fact, shrinking. Now we have this polarity. We have found, too, that the large-scale housing developments that we've been building uh, are, not, are being abandoned. And they are being abandoned at a very big scale. Public housing developments, those of you who may have seen the film that, that, was, that we prepared for the Department of Housing and Urban Development called No Place to Rest, its he rest uh, His Head, will have witnessed the large-scale abandonment of housing developments. When one looks at the uh, third world countries, the underdeveloped countries that are attracted to this conference, when one looks at the housing developments that are being built uh, by well-meaning governments in South America, in Africa, and in Western Europe, one wonders whether they, each of them, must repeat the same mistakes we have repeated in America in order to learn from them. For the past 20 years, we have been embarked on a venture which is now simply bankrupt. Not only is the low-income housing failing, and this is in every city, large cities and small, um, but our moderate income housing is going into receivership again and again. And one looks at the factors, one finds firstly that a large concentration of low-income residents in a particular area produces an environment which is not conducive to uh, the maintenance of a stable community, a community of opportunity for the residents. There is a pre prevailing high crime rate, high vandalism rate, high turnover rate, and high abandonment rate. The housing is simply being abandoned. And the basic factor is the percentage of low-income residents and the size of the development. The fact that many of these developments are built as anonymous high-rise buildings complicates the factor still further. Now, the ability, our ability, 
to integrate low and moderate income residents into the mainstream of American life, into the mainstream of urban opportunity, has failed. Uh, for many, particularly those in Canada, their cities are still viable and vital, and they do not face the problems that we uh, face now. Our cities, for the most part, and even New York is heading in that direction, our cities are being abandoned, uh, if those that have not already been abandoned, by the middle-income residents. Now, what options do we have? The, in the recent years, in the past three to, five, three to four years, the U.S. has not been building too much federally assisted housing. Uh, there are many factors for this and many explanations, and depending on whom you listen to and what party he belongs to, you get a different explanation. Uh, the point is that there are we have an administration that currently who, who is not elected by low and moderate income residents and do not, therefore, uh, feel that obligated in providing this housing, uh, housing for this group. We also find that the extent of the failure of low and moderate income housing, uh, the effect not only of this housing on the residents who lived in these communities, but the effect of this housing on surrounding middle-income communities uh, has discouraged the populace, the U.S. The general populace, from supporting through their politicians the construction of low and moderate income housing. The architects and planners aside, those uh, the architects and planners uh, who are not constructing housing do not represent the uh, the populace. People are frightened. The truth is that much of the large uh, public housing developments uh, have represented fear in the surrounding middle income communities. We have to recognize that this is what interviews uh, point out and suggest. The inflation resulting from various uh, efforts uh, at guns and butter policy have done li very little to uh, provide uh, low, in, uh, low interest money required for housing. But all these things group together, and we have a program now or of no program for housing at all in the U.S. for low and moderate income populations. But the indications are that a change is in the wind. But what do we do? It is pretty clear the efforts of various planning groups, the efforts of Paul Davidoff, who's here at the conference in particular, uh, has done much to change the whole atmosphere of the way we think about putting low-income housing into suburban areas. A recent Supreme Court decision, dating back just a few weeks, uh, has said that suburban communities who restrict zoning to ensure that only single-family housing on half acre and acre lots uh, to ensure the presence of middle income communities in their area and to ensure that there is no low income or multifamily housing built there, the Supreme Court has decided that this is unlawful. And it requires communities to zone housing with a higher with a, uh, to zone communities, to zone municipalities, with a percentage for multifamily housing. Now, this would appear to be a breakthrough, but I am myself very perturbed. And I want to share my concerns and fears with you because we have really opened a Pandora box. Sometimes the the best efforts and the best plans of and the most well-intentioned of ideals uh, do not always produce the results we are after, witness the failure of the public housing program. A few years ago, the Supreme Court also produced a landmark decision in the U.S. This was 
based on the uh, presentation Brown versus Board of Education. It used data compiled by Dr. James Coleman of the University of Chicago, and he demonstrated rather conclusively that inequities in education resulting from the separation of schools with low-income residents sending their children to low-income ghetto schools and middle-income residents and living in middle-income neighborhoods sending their children to middle-income schools produced serious inequities. And from that came the resolution to bus children from one area to another in order to produce schools. Very recently, Dr. Coleman has made a statement that his studies indicate that among other things, the busing program has resulted in uh, aggravating white flight. Now, we know that white flight was created much by housing opportunities out in the suburbs, low interest mortgages, 1964 to uh, 1970 produced more housing in America than had been built in the previous 20 years almost. But that coupled with uh, the influx of low income residents during exactly that same period into the cities seems to have accentuated white flight. So now we have the peculiar situation of black low-income children being bused to white middle-income areas and schools which are no longer white and middle-income areas. That is to say, in order to prevent this forced integration of low-income and middle-income children in schools, the whites have simply taken the middle-income residents have taken the option of moving out to the suburbs to separate municipalities where the buses could not follow. So here was an incredible effort on the part of sociologists, educators, black community, low income community to try to create integration in schools and they resulted not only in preventing the integration in schools, but they ended up producing municipalities where there were not only not good schools anymore, but the municipalities had lost their tax base with middle income residents, with their flight, and the job opportunities followed. That is to say, factories, offices, commercial areas moved out to the suburbs with the middle income residents so now you have a core city area without good schools, without job opportunities, without the opportunity of social contact, in fact, without all the things that the low income and black populations moved into Central City for from their small towns and rural communities. Now we are suggesting that we forcibly provide new low-income and moderate-income housing in white suburbs. And we firmly believe that fiat can accomplish this. Now, there is no question in my mind on the basis of the surveys that we have done of housing, low- and moderate-income housing across our nation that large, low-income communities are a failure. And there's no question in my mind that we must locate, we must mix low-income residents with middle-income residents, and we must locate this housing not among the poor and not in the deprived areas and not cities that are dead or dying, but among the vital areas of our country which are in fact the suburbs. But how do we accomplish it? Now when I say how do we accomplish it, I, I mean I really don't know. Because what I'm afraid of is that the middle income communities faced 
with the reality of multifamily housing and moderate and low income housing moving in to their suburbs will simply, through their legislators, through their, uh, the people they elect, through their politicians, simply ensure that the government not have or not build or not provide funds for low and moderate income housing. Because this is obviously one of the ways to solve that particular problem. In other words, they don't say, they can't say because the Supreme Court says you must zone multifamily housing in communities that previously had only single family housing. But uh, they say nothing about money. And moderate and low income housing must be built with some assistance, whether it's state or federal. But it must be built with. A few years ago, the Supreme Court also produced a landmark decision in the U.S. This was based on the uh, presentation Brown versus Board of Education. It used data compiled by Dr. James Coleman of the University of Chicago, and he demonstrated rather conclusively that inequities in education resulting from the separation of schools with low-income residents sending their children to low-income ghetto schools and middle-income residents and living in middle-income neighborhoods sending their children to middle-income schools produced serious inequities. And from that came the resolution to bus children from one area to another in order to produce schools. Very recently, Dr. Coleman has made a statement that his studies indicate that among other things, the busing program has resulted in uh, aggravating white flight. Now, we know that white flight was created much by housing opportunities out in the suburbs, low interest mortgages, 1964 to uh, 1970 produced more housing in America than had been built in the previous 20 years almost. But that coupled with uh, the influx of low-income residents during exactly that same period into the cities seems to have accentuated white flight. So now we have the peculiar situation of black low-income children being bused to white middle-income areas and schools which are no longer white and middle-income areas. That is to say, in order to prevent this forced integration of low-income and middle-income children in schools, the whites have simply taken, the middle-income residents, have taken the option of moving out to the suburbs, to separate municipalities where the buses could not follow. So here was an incredible effort on the part of sociologists, educators, black community, low-income community to try to create integration in schools. And they resulted not only in preventing the integration in schools, but they ended up producing municipalities where there were not only not good schools anymore, but the municipalities had lost their tax base with middle-income residents, with their flight, and the job opportunities followed. That is to say, factories, offices, commercial areas moved out to the suburbs with the middle-income residents. So now you have a core city area without good schools, without job opportunities without the opportunity of social contact, in fact, without all the things that the low income and black populations moved into Central City for from their small towns and rural communities. Now we are suggesting that we forcibly 
provide new low-income and moderate-income housing in white suburbs. And we firmly believe that fiat can accomplish this. Now, there is no question in my mind on the basis of the surveys that we have done of housing, low and moderate income housing across our nation, that large, low income communities are a failure. And there's no question in my mind that we must locate, we must mix low income residents with middle income residents, and we must locate this housing not among the poor, and not in the deprived areas, and not cities that are dead or dying, but among the vital areas of our country, which are in fact the suburbs. But how do we accomplish it? Now when I say how do we accomplish it, I, I mean I really don't know. Because what I'm afraid of is that the middle income communities faced with the reality of multifamily housing and moderate and low income housing moving in to their suburbs will simply, through their legislators, through their, uh, the people they elect, through their politicians, simply ensure that the government not have or not build or not provide funds for low and moderate income housing. Because this is obviously one of the ways to solve that particular problem. In other words, they don't say, they can't say because the Supreme Court says you must zone multifamily housing in communities that previously had only single family housing, but uh, they say nothing about money. And moderate and low income housing must be built with some assistance whether it's state or federal, but it must be built with some assistance. And the middle income populations are the people who in the end are being taxed, are in the end the most politically influential, and they can simply solve the problem by making sure that no funds are so allocated. So this is our dilemma. I don't know how to solve it, I have some ideas, and I have read of the ideas of others, and I'm going to suggest them to you, uh, because the ideas for solving the problems are almost as disturbing as the problem itself. It has been suggested by the Massachusetts Housing Finance Agency as a result of experiments it has done that the way to integrate low-income residents into middle-income developments is to subsidize the middle income residents just as you subsidize the low income residents. In other words, you bribe the middle income residents to live with low income residents. And this is done by providing the middle income residents with housing which is either can be purchased or rented at below market interest rates. Uh, not much below, but significantly below, so that people who might not otherwise want to live with low-income residents find that this incentive is enough to make the difference. It's a bribe. It's a carrot. It has been suggested by others, some of them on my staff, that stable communities, that's to say stable mixes of low- and middle-income residents can be determined by the nature of the physical plant by the degree of mix. That is to say, so long as, for instance, a high-rise building with 100 families sharing an entry can tolerate, on the basis of research, about 15 to 20 percent of low-income residents, and that's all, in order to maintain stability. Stability can simply be measured by the ability to go on attracting and keeping the middle-income residents in the building. Now, you might say, why? We have to go to all this effort. The point is that the middle income residents are very much a stabilizing element. That with middle income residents dominating, the crime rate is low, the vacancy rate is low, the abandonment rate is low, the schools are good, the job opportunities are good, and so on and so on. 
Now, a high-rise building will tolerate, apparently, a, a low percentage of low-income residents. A walk-up or three-story building will tolerate about 30% low-income residents. And row houses or single-family housing can be built, and you can have a mix of low and middle-income residents with the low-income residents going up as a high as about 40 to 50 percent, based again on an examination of existing communities. Now, we have been able to find what appears to be a formula. I am simplifying. I'm not giving you all the other factors and variables just for, for the sake of argument for the moment. But how do you maintain this mix, these percentages? Now, it has been suggested, it is policy of the U.S. government to essentially forcibly mix low-income residents into all middle-income communities. Now, this is something of a deprivation of the rights of individuals. That is to say, the government says you must put low-income residents in middle-income developments that are, or moderate-income developments that are go receive government subsidy. And our government provides, when it builds, subsidy for most housing that is not upper income. Let's say even middle-income houses in the suburbs receive a low-interest mortgage loan. So you can, in fact, legislate that all middle-income housing have a percentage of low-income residents or low-income units built within it. But it seems that if we are legislating in a way that is contrary to the rights or the total freedom of individuals, that, and here is the argument, uh, that there is the opposite side of the coin. And the opposite side of the coin, according to the people who, various attorneys who have been studying it, is that you must establish quotas. That is to say, you must establish a quota limiting the percentage of low-income residents that you can put into any community. And that this will be the only way, in fact, to achieve stability. Stability, again, means to continue to be able to attract and maintain the middle-income residents. Now, quotas sound very much like a deprivation of rights as well, like a restriction on constitutional rights. And the people who argue for this position are people who say, you force a certain, you must guarantee a certain outcome. There are two sides of the coin. Since the effort is to create communities in which you guarantee for the low-income resident that he is living in a dominantly middle-income community, you want to make sure that the host community, the middle-income community, where you have the jobs, education, uh, social contact opportunities, remains stable. Now, this suggests a degree of manipulation of people, a manipulation of programs, a manipulation of financing, which many may find abhorrent. I am certainly myself disturbed by it. It is a formula, however, that begins to show some promise of working. Now, I really at a, at a loss to go further. Uh, I wanted to present you with some of the things that we are thinking about, and I don't have answers. All I have are partial solutions, some of which are very disturbing. We began our studies many years ago in looking at trying to understand how the form, the physical form of residential environments affect people's ability to interact with each other, to form small, say, communities of self-interest within a large housing development, to defend their right for a peaceable environment that they can control and maintain and use for the raising of their children, the pursuit of friendship, and so on. 
Now, we've come a long way in defining what those ingredients are. Now, we've begun to look at the social factors in combination with the physical, so that because any environment uh, in, in affecting human behavior is a mixture of, or in, of the interaction of social and physical. We have seen that public housing, large-scale housing developments, even row houses, occupied solely by low-income communities, provide very little in the way of opportunity. It may provide housing, which is sound and occupied, but it does not provide opportunities. We know the type of housing that we should be building for low-income residents in the suburbs. And we can demonstrate, I think, to the fearful middle-income residents that, cert that all public housing is not bad and that you don't have to build public housing or moderate income housing or low income housing as high rises. You can have alternatives. But I think that the lawyers who argue for a quota system are perhaps correct that in the end, based on our interviews in the suburbs and among middle income residents, the fear is not for a small percentage of low income residents, it is a fear that once low-income residents move in at all, the community will flee. It suggests that we must adopt a program of government intervention and control, uh, which is, in fact, disturbing. And I, myself, would welcome, at this point I stop because I have no solutions. We are at a point of trying things. And I would welcome any con comments and insights from the rest of you any ideas that you may have on how to achieve this, or any, just any comments at the madness that we find ourselves in.